uh, our honoured guest, and we look forward to your talk this evening on Sophocles, Theban lead the rulers, right? Theban rulers and Aristotle's tyrant classical Greek lessons on deliberation and concord. And may I just say this is the first lecture in Nafplion, but the second lecture in our series, in this year's series, which is devoted to the topic of leadership in humanism. So Sophocles, I, I realize, was something of a leader, having been a general and a Tamias and a symbol right, and an advisor during the state emergency. Um, so he's a leader, but what about his, his um, poetry, his tragedies, especially his Theban plays, and what have they to tell us about good leaders and, and bad? Can, can I just <laughs> throw that out? Or, um, and then you can take the floor, everyone else. I, I may ask you at some point about education uh, nowadays and politics, because Aristotle, whom you have be referring to, uh, believed very, very strongly that education moral education and politics were interlinked Absolutely. and that you could not achieve virtue on your own. You had to be part of the polis, right? And you had to actively participate. And I should also add that this, besides your stellar status as a professor of classics, you're also an activist, if I may say so. It's a nice word. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, it's very, very few words in the English language that is remotely positive about um, interfering. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing I um, discovered when thinking actually about Aristotle on omission and commission. He's the first person to theorise this possibly properly, that you can do just as much harm by not doing something that it's within your gift to do um, as you can by proactively doing something. And it seems to me that it's one of his most precious insights. Um, we tend to vote in our politicians by assessing them just on simply having what we say in English, kept their nose clean, right? have they never made any mistakes, not right. what have they done with their status, what have they done with their money, how many charitable institutions have they set up, you know, how many people have they actually helped, how many times have they actually you know, done something really constructive to make society better, rather than have they managed not to go to the brothel. <laughs> and um, I, I know that I have a, a reputation, probably, for being somebody who, if they say the range of terms in English are sticking your oar in, uh, <laughs> being a, a busybody, fingers in pies, mm -hmm. um, those sorts of terms. There are hardly any neutral ones in English. The only one that isn't is, is, is intervene. Intervene mm -hmm. is reasonably okay. All of the others are negative. And actually, legal philosophers have told me that British law is unusually uh, reluctant. British lawmakers have been compared with the rest of the world's <laughs> judiciaries. Most unusually reluctant to legislate for um, omission. Even if you know your neighbour is beating their child to death, you're under no legal obligation whatsoever to tell them. That is not the case in many judiciaries in the world. And this is down to something cultural in Britain that has its good sides, which is every Englishman's hope is castle and privacy laws, but it also has very un-Aristotelian ramifications about now not uh, fulfilling your responsibilities towards your polis. So that's really my response to that. So in Sophocles, who I think, and I'm going to argue tonight, ultimately informs Aristotle's political and ethical theory far more than has been given, um, uh, than has been, he's been given credit for. Um, it's just as interested in people not doing things and people standing on the sidelines or letting tyrants get on with it and how difficult it is, yes, to stand up or interfere. But if you look for omission, <laughs> it, you find very interesting examples in Sophocles. And as you say, I'm absolutely sure that this is because he's the only one of the three Greek tragedians who held public office. He has the hands-on empirical experience right. of having to deliberate and having to make life and death probably a strategos yes, um, decisions and Antony as you know he's, he's, he's responsible for the entire treasury and when he's brought in in 411 we're talking about absolute crisis and, and, and terrible bereavements and, and so on so he's got that hands-on experience and I think that's why people really listen to him and then the poetry is good too <laughs> 
where does this hang if it does with Solon's regulation on the prescription that you've got to take sides when the stats that you can't just stand on the sidelines there? Yeah, I think, I, think I, I, would, I would agree with Solon. Solon, of course, gets recommended by Aristotle. Uh, well, certainly whoever wrote the, the Athenian Politia, um, who was probably one of <laughs> Aristotle's PhD students, for having had the opportunity to become a tyrant and, and not taken it. So that's an actually an interesting example of commission by omission. He does something virtue by virtuous by not taking the opportunity. But he also brings in, say, Sack of Fire. I mean, he also actively says, look, we don't have to carry on with these heavy debts. We can't just get rid of them because of the stasis. And so someone was very careful in the bits of poetry that he talks about. Well, he puts in other people's mouths, you could have been a tyrant and you yeah. didn't. Yeah. And he has his defence that he did these other things, but, uh, and it would have been going one bridge too far to the tyrant. Yes. Exactly. Well, I think he's a, he's a wonderful um, exemplar, um, and he's one of the people, as I say, that the Aristotelians, political theorists, have um, approved of. But I think Creon, what I'm really getting, I'm going to argue tonight, I think Creon is fundamental, Creon in Antigone, uh, is fundamental to Aristotle's definition of, of tyranny in, in Book 5 of the politics. I think he's lurking everywhere mm -hmm. and um, because that politics, that part of the politics, the his const Aristotle's constitutional descriptions of the different models actually lies at the bottom of all European political theory, I mean all of it. It was when it was translated into modern languages that our language of political science was, was invented. I mean it's quite extraordinary and nobody's yet written a big book on the reception of Aristotle's politics in the Renaissance, they haven't. I mean, it's extraordinary. I might, I might actually do it, yeah. Um, they sort of know it, people pay lip service to it, but when actually documenting how um, it comes in, and, and Shakespeare certainly had cited the copy in English, and it's right behind Lear and Macbeth, which I'm also going to argue about. But that means that so is Sophocles' Creon, right behind Lear and Macbeth, even though he's coming at it through. Oh. Aristotle. So when was the first English translation of Aristotle? 1598. But there were the actual translation, um, and like the translations of Plutarch's, it was from Amiot. Yeah. It was from the French version mm -hmm. by a guy called Le Roi. But <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Not the <It's> all <laughs> But but uh, there were summaries and discussions and dis discourses upon the politics in English by the 1560s, 1570s. Um, um, so it's very much in the discourse at that time. And they didn't know it through Latin adaptations, because Cicero did various things, but he didn't do the politics or the Aristotle line. It's too hard going for Cicero. Absolutely. But what Shakespeare did know through Latin was the Antigone, like Thomas Watson's version. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the great long-standing scholarly mistakes about Shakespeare has been this quotation that he had little Latin and less Greek. Well, actually he had very little Greek, an enormous amount of Latin, churchish Latin, and all, all the Greek tragedies were available in Latin. Uh, cribs that were circulating very widely by the 1560s. Um, and they were quite simplified. I mean, they're very interesting books in themselves. But um, modern Shakespeare scholars are, are now very um, happy to accept that Shakespeare knew perfectly well what was in most of Greek tragedy. But via these Latin cribs, I actually got a wonderful postdoc at the moment whose actual topic is precisely that. She's actually reading all these Latin cribs and she's seeing how many copies were in British, or I wasn't Britain then, English and Scottish libraries in the 16th and early 17th centuries. And then she's making links precisely with Shakespearean, Marlovian and Jacobean theatre. That's Lucy Jackson. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, see, she's at King's with me doing that now because I haven't got enough life left to do the war. I think we're talking, what I really hope today today is the genealogy of tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, think it, I think it really be, really begins, okay, we have Herodotus or Periander and, and, and things like that, but the detailed examination of how they act under pressure in immediate circumstances when they should be deliberating, <laughs> and in fact they're making peremptory decisions on who. Mm -hmm. um, the eubulia doesn't happen. I believe, this is with Sophocles, You were to teach a course on leadership, <laughs> which uh, text would you put on that, uh, on your syllabus? Iliad book one, <laughs> straight out, <laughs> no question whatsoever. Um, probably Eurylochus and Odysseus, whether we should have a mutiny on Odysseus's ship or not, <laughs> when he puts him in danger. That would be a small excerpt, but I think we would have a bit of that. We would certainly have, um, we'd have to have the Persians of, 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 of um, Aeschylus, and we would have to have the, the, the three Theban plays. That's just the fifth, uh, that's just, that's just over in the fifth century. Would you put some British on there, and if not, I probably would. I haven't um, thought about it, but it, because he doesn't quite as immediately do the city-state under immediate pressure from actually, this is where the word humanism should come in, because despite Sophocles' alleged piety and the fact that the gods always turn out to be right in, in Sophocles, they're also at rather a remove. When Creon's making those decisions on the hoof, and Oedipus is making those decisions on the hoof, do I torture him, do I consult the oracle, do I believe Tiresias, you know, what, what do I do right now? Um, it, it's amazingly anthropocentric, which is why Aristotle liked it, because he's only interested, he's not interested in divinity and tragedy, or metaphysics and tragedy, he's just not, that's not what he does, he does ethics and tragedy. So Sophocles is strangely more appealing, I think, politically, um, than Euripides is to... Do you really think Pentheus? Yes, I do think Pentheus, but as I said, if the, if the interference of Dionysus makes mm. it such a dominantly God, deity-centred play, uh, I find Sophocles curiously secular in the actual mm -hmm. um, scenes. We do have, of course, Pentheus throwing his weight about and making silly decisions. Um, Let's think of some of the others. Let's go through Euripides. Creon and Medea is pretty stupid. <laughs> it's another Creon. You know? Well, you think there should be. <laughs> yes, of course. And actually, that is one of the places where you see Eubulia in with Ithras. Yes, I would put the, uh, the Athenian way. <laughs> uh, Oedipus at Colonus, again, is very interesting from that point of view. So this Theseus figure tends to be a model of correct deliberation and consultation with the citizens. Hold on there while I go and court an assembly, you know, or, or, <laughs> or this sort of thing. Yes, of course. But I prefer the bad guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you learn more from the negative mm -hmm. um, example. And it is interesting that Aristotle gives you the description of the good tyrant who can cope by actually we talk about bad tyrant first, traditional tyrant, who, who is Creo in the Antigone, or Periander, or Pittacus. And then you have, he says, how to get away with tyranny. But the only way you can get away with tyranny is by pretending it's not a tyranny. So you wander around like Augustus saying, <laughs> let's all consult. <laughs> um, and here are my accounts, all transparent. You, you could argue that President Trump's problem is that he's not good enough at appearances, mm -hmm. that they've all been corrupt, mm -hmm. that they've all do dirty deals, that they all do background stuff, but that he is not concerned with secrecy. You could argue that. But so we're not going to talk about You said you uh, talk about Shakespeare as well. A little bit. Yes, a little bit. So his bad guys, you think, are sort of influenced, uh, his concept of tyranny is influenced by Aristotle 
Sophocles be Aristotle, or how, how is that? I mean, yes, by Sophocles. Well, both actually. The language he uses, and you, know, you can actually trace words like mm -hmm. how tyranny is used and monarchy in, in, in Shakespeare, in Shakespeare mm -hmm. yes. Um, the language he uses, the theoretical ideas, are definitely ingrained in an in a Aristotelian tradition uh, that uh, Machiavelli is the obvious um, <laughs> other Renaissance place where that comes from. But in the case of Antigone, there's not just uh, a crib of the Septem Tracodiae of Sophocles floating around that the humanists are reading. So there's an excellent poetic version mm -hmm. by a, a very considerable uh, British poet called Thomas Watson, mm -hmm. which was famous and it was published as a single book and, and, and was an important Renaissance book. And so I think in the case of Antigone, we can go an awful lot further. Um, even his contemporaries remarked that the ending of Lear, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking Lear in a particular way, Eubulia is a huge topic. People talk constantly about whether this old man can take, can do, can he do deliberation at all. The opening scene where he's like, oh yeah, let's just carve up the kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and Goral and Regan may be horrible people, but you know, everyone, all the adults in the court say, <coughs> Is there no institution in 4th century, whatever it is, 8th century England? No, there's no court, there's no magistracies, there's no civil society, there's no <laughs> legal structure, there doesn't seem to, seem to be a high priest that you can call on at all. And that's very like Creon Thebes. There is actually no... Uh, no safety net. Or... Safety net or... Uh, Apparate, state apparatus, if we're going to go out to say, you know, there's just nothing, there is not, no, no, no safety net, no gap at all. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that I think, but, but even his contemporaries noticed that the ending where Lear brings on Cordelia in his arms, mm -hmm. my beloved youngest child, blah, 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 blah. Um, even they could not fail to notice that a tyrant had, had come on with a child in, in, in his arms. Um, before you know, that link was made, and once you accept that, then reading Lear in particular with um, Antigone in the background becomes less uh, uh, dangerous. I'm not remotely arguing Cthulhu for sure here. I'm not saying there are particular uh, echoes. Um, I'm not trying to, to do that, though I think there are a few actually. Just that. Um, this was all in the air. Shakespeare was unbelievably well read. I mean, just extraordinarily well read. That is another lecture, <laughs> uh, and I'm giving it um, at Stratford this summer um, to the British History Historical Association. So I'm going to talk about some lesser known bits of Greece and Rome in, 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 in Shakespeare's plays, in particular the political theory. Then, so. This paper's been very helpful to me in beginning to put, put that one together. I just think the Greeks need to be very, very proud <laughs> that uh, Sophocles, to me, is, although he did it through dialogue, fictional dialogues, is, I think, the father of political theory. I would go that far. And would you say that uh, Sophocles is criticising democracy as much as pure? No. 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 <laughs> no, Everybody does. Yes. No, yeah, no. I don't think so. You have far less emphasis on um, autocratic threat. Right. Far less. The line in, in Antigone that I remember really affecting me even as an undergraduate maybe was, you know, has the chorus come on, they say that Creon has called us here. Uh, especially, and he says, I've called you Dihar Panto, separately from everybody else, because you are loyal to me. So you have, you have faction no. built in, instead of saying, I have called an assembly <laughs> of all the people, because this is obviously a decision that we have to make together in civil war, what are we going to do with these bodies, or even a boule of chosen 
530 year old pluses or even a, a super boule of, of <laughs> it's not that and we hear several more things about this chorus and we very rarely hear this amount that they're rich yes that they're loyal they've always supported the house of lions that is made up absolutely clear and antigone uses this bizarre word of them that i can't find anywhere else called koiranidae which is i don't know what koiranidae means exactly but is she saying they're the descendants of the spot the spartoi the same men um, you know, what particular status have these guarantors got? And even they keep saying, um, we really don't like what you're doing. Um, and there is some sense in what she's saying, and so on. So he, we have a chorus that is already a tyrant defeat, dividing the state at the very, very beginning, and there is no need for him to do that. I think Antigone also says that no, Hymen says yeah. that um, the demos, the, the view of the dark, dark demos is that um, Antigone is in the right. Exactly. Side. So, exactly. So he no, is, he is flouting yes. democracy. He is. Yeah. No, I, th I think, I think, I don't think Sophocles um, is got, he's saying, certainly the place we've got, the Oclos does not get the same bad right. name yeah. as. Uh, as it does in your opinion. I just thought that you know, Aristotle also says that democracy can become tyrannous or tyrannical yeah. uh, if, if governed by appetite yeah. and not according to the law. And if you don't educate right. your demos, that's yeah. the crucial. So I thought mm -hmm. there might be a sort of um, side message about um, democracy. Well, our only representative of the demos in, in really demos in, in the Antigone is the guard. Mm -hmm. right. And again, the very fact that Sophocles goes out of his way, I mean really out of his way, 50 lines out of his way, mm -hmm. to show how Creon truly has divided even the people who guard graves in Thebes, right? Even that small professional body are fighting like mad right. because they're all so frightened. So they can't even do Homanoia uh, in, in, of the Fula case, <laughs> they can't even agree together. They've already been split off from the Garantes. Antigone and her sister are fighting. The two sisters, using very strong language at each other about secrecy, you know. So it's like every single relationship, in this, every single koinonia, every single partnership is corrupted right. from the top. I think it's a brilliant analysis um, of what goes on under tyranny. Most of us, um, I know Greece is different, uh, those of you who can remember the dictatoria, but you know, most, most of us can't. I have never lived under a tyranny. It's useful to learn about it from Sophocles and Tyranny. There's a breach of the breaking down of ties of koinonia. Some of the Sicilians can say also come from, uh, from stasis. Yes. He, he does, very much um, so. one doesn't need to live under a tyranny if one lives under stasis. No. Exactly. But it's not in this lecture, but you know, I've written this, I hope, accessible book on Aristotle that's coming out on May 3rd. But you, well, if you do live in a society where you don't like what's going on at the top at all and you think they are encouraging conflict and hatred, it is a small act of resistance every day mm -hmm. to be nice to everybody you meet mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and, and trust them. Mm -hmm. I, a couple of years ago, ended up in Preveza. Preveza? Is that a good one? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Off a cruise boat where I was lecturing. I wanted to go for a swim and I got off. And I had a lovely lady taxi driver and I said, find me the nearest beach within half an hour. Drive me to it. I just need a really good swim. And I left my computer and my purse and my handbag in the car, deliberately. She was nice. And I said, can you look after those while I go for one? I came back, she was in tears. She was about my age, incredibly poor because of all the things to me. And she just was in tears saying, you trusted me. You, you, le you left all this money. You didn't just treat me, you know, Northern European coming here, assuming I'd nick your... And I said, of course not. I could tell you were a nice person. And we had this written. <laughs> but I do really genuinely think that. And I often go around, not, I hope, being completely stupid about who I trust, but it, it's a small act of um, 
you can't rep all of us, even if you want class conflict and to give 1% of society 81% of the world and all the other, you uh, get rid of our civil liberties and all, all the rest of things. And I've met Americans who feel very much the same, that, that, that civil, civility in the public arena is actually a resistance in itself. Would you say that um, because we have deeper deals with therapy and these issues the way yeah. it is, would you say that the theater people, because as you know there, there's a, a long line of antagonists, yeah. did they get the message, uh, the, the Sophocleian message yeah. maybe more than the political theorists? Yes, I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean the production history of Antigone is fascinating. And the rewrites, I mean. The, yeah. the, it doesn't get before, discovered yeah. till much later than most of the Greek tragedies. Mm -hmm. It's not until Hegel. I mean, it really isn't until late Enlightenment. <laughs> it's very, very odd. You sort of say, where, where are the 18th century the Antigones? They're, you sort of feel they should, you should, well, Voltaire should have done. They're not there. It, it, it's quite remarkable. They're very interested in Oedipus a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the play that, that, that it, was, it took till then, but once it did, it very quickly became the most performed play in the world, very quickly, 19th century. And of course, once Henri and Brecht have done their respective, very different, and I do, I do mention that tonight. Absolutely, I think that performance history can often provide truthful access to the importance of a, a particular day. Having said that, it's quite clear there's far more discussion about Tigny in the fourth century BC that are most, and it's not just Aristotle, you know, it's in Demosthenes, there's everybody knew that play. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a masterpiece very, very quickly. So it had its time, its polluted site in antiquity, and then it has had, but only for the last two and a quarter centuries, unlike, as I say, many, many of the others. And I haven't quite figured out why. I think it's to do with, in the, I think it's probably to do with individual rights. That so it goes with the great areas of revolution, and electoral reform, and universal suffrage, as opposed to the nobles or something. I think it's something to do with the individual, but I haven't fully worked it out. And it's not, it's not a gender issue. It's not. No, not really. It's my name. No. <laughs> no, no, not like Madeira. I mean, you can play it that way if you want to, but that's not why Hegel was interested in it. In particular, or Matthew Arnold, or George Eliot. I think I'm going to try She wrote an essay on it. Which is uh, on coming to me and passing away, and on memory and recognition. 
Constitution. It's got a whole chapter on constructive use of scholae, leisure, a um, whole chapter on intentions, certainly one on Tom Messon. Um, what else has it got? Anyway, it's an Aristotelian advice on how to live now. And I genuinely, and this whole chapter on being green, I think he's the first. You know, the first reference to overfishing in world literature is in, um, in Aristotle. So that's coming out, and I, very, I really think if everybody read it, we all came Aristotelians, we could say, save our koinonias and our planet. We've got the answer to goose yet. Sorry? Oh, yes. <laughs> the goose, well, the wall painted. John was there as well. I was there as well. Of course you were. And I was wondering, have you identified the. Um, well, I sent, I sent off the final copy of the text to uh, Walter Kuchner. There were various helpful suggestions about peace and philosophers that we found in, in between us in, in, in um, later literature, but I don't think we've solved it as such resoundingly. We couldn't unless we actually found these Austrian bohemian <laughs> painters' diagrams and, and, and were able to talk to them. But it's a very beautiful goose. I mean, I think the fact that it was a, a, a set test in art schools. The, the, can you draw the goose? Can you draw the, the, these feathers? But perhaps you should explain exactly the context of the goose. Yes, sorry, we're taking yes, it Yes, you explain. <laughs> It's to do oh, to the Academy of Athens. Yes, I, I gave it a lecture at the Academy of Athens who were very kind enough, the theatre division, to give me a honorary doctorate last year, which was a wonderful moment. And so I decided to try and answer a question which has perplexed me since I was a teenager and I first saw an on magnificent fresco inside the uh, portico of the main part of the Cappadocia University, which shows great figures from Greek history with a particular emphasis on thinkers. Aristotle has shown with all his peripatetic students dissecting an enormous grey lad goose, enormous goose. So I set the question of why the goose, which meant that I could have a foray into the significance of geese in ancient culture, which was fun. Shall we? Close our little interview, but first, before I thank you, first and foremost, may I thank uh, Anna Stabakopoulou, uh, Lucia Thanasaki, <laughs> you and Bowie. Yeah. Thank you. Well, can I much. thank all of you for having me here? It's a very great honour and very, very fun. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Can you spare us? Que calicronia, Seolus, Tatakume, Ectenestera, Que. Με τρόπο πιο πανηγυρικό επάνω με μετά το τέλος της διαλέξεως. Είναι η δεύτερη κατά σειρά μου διαλέξη μας. Η πρώτη έγινε στην Θεσσαλονίκη πριν από ένα μήνα. Ε, αλλά η πρώτη στο Ναύκλειο, στην κοιτίδα του κέντρου ελληνικών σπουδών. Με αφορμή τα δέκα χρόνια λειτουργίας του κέντρου, γιορτάζουμε τα γενεθιά μας, τον Ιούνιο. Η Ακαδημαϊκή Επιτροπή επέλεξε ως κεντρικό θέμα των διαλέξεων 2017-2018 ηγεσία και ανθρωπιστικές αξίες, γιατί η θεματική αυτή απηχεί την αποστολή του κέντρου όπως την συνέλαβε ο ευεργέτης ε, Αμερικανός Πουλ Μέλλον. Ο Πουλ Μέλλον είναι εκείνος ο οποίος ίδρυσε το Μητροπολιτικό μας κέντρο στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες, το οποίο εγγενιάστηκε επισήμως το 1963. Και εμείς είμαστε το ομόλογο εν Ελλάδη κέντρο. Γιατί, Γιατί το κέντρο, με μικρό κάπα, το κέντρο γενικών σπουδών είναι η Ελλάδα. Κατά τον ευεργέτη Φιλέλληνα, το κέντρο ελληνικών σπουδών που ξεκίνησε το 1963 είχε αποστολή να υπηρετήσει επιστημονικά επιλέξει τις ανθρωπιστικές αξίες των Ελλήνων, τις οποίες ταύτισε συγκεκριμένα με τις αξίες του ευρωπαϊκού διαφωτισμού του 18ου αιώνα. Οι αξίες αυτές υποστηρίζουν την φιλελευθερία και την αξιοπρέπεια του πολίτη σε μια δημοκρατική κοινωνία. Πρώτα διατυπώθηκαν και συζητήθηκαν, όπως ξέρετε, 
στην Αθήνα του 5ου αιώνα, όπω τόνισε στην ομιλία του στην ομιλία που εξεφώνησε ο Μέλλεν κατά τα εγγένεια του κέντρου το 1963. Από ιδρύσεώς του λοιπόν, το κέντρο έχει αποστολή όχι μόνο να δώσει νέο προσανατολισμό στις αρχαιοελληνικές σπουδές, αλλά και να δείξει πόσο επίκαιρες είναι οι ανθρωπιστικές αξίες των Ελλήνων για τους σύγχρονους πολίτες και τους ηγέτες του. Η σημερινή μας, η απόψηνή μας ομιλήτρια είναι η διακεκριμένη καθηγήτρια εντός παρένθεσεως ε, ακτιβίστρια με την καλύτερη δυνατή, δυνατόν ε, έννοια η καθηγήτρια κλασικών σπουδών στο King's College του Λονδίνου και συμβουλευτική διευθύντρια του Αρχείου Παραστάσεων Ελληνικού και Ρωμαϊκού Δράματος στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Οξφόρτης. Εν συντομία, η Edith Hall είναι καθηγήτρια κλασικών σπουδών στο King's College του Λονδίνου. Έχει εκδώσει πάνω από 20 βιβλία για την αρχαία και ρωμαϊκή λογοτεχνία και ιδέε και τη συνεχή παρουσία του από την αναγέννηση και έπειτα. Δηλαδή, ασχολείται και με την πρόσληψη. Πρέπει να σα πω ότι προσωπικώ οφείλω τεράστια οφειλή, οφείλω χάριτα για το βιβλίο τη. Inventing the Barbarian. Mm. Ε, ήταν μαθήτρια, αυτά δεν είναι στο βιογραφικό της, θα, θα λέω γιατί ήμασταν συμφιτητές, αλλά ήταν πολύ πολύ καλύτεροι. Ε, ήταν μαθήτρια του Hugh Lloyd Jones, right? Were you not? Yes. <laughs> yes, well, well, but, but, but your book is extraordinary. Your Barbarian's book and mm -hmm. among uh, so many of your books. Το πιο πρόσφατα, τα, τα πιο πρόσφατα βιβλία της είναι τα εξής. Adventures with Iphigenia in Taurus, Euripides Black Sea Tragedy, 2013. Introducing the Ancient Greeks, 2015. And uh, Women Classical Scholars, Unsealing the Fountain from the Renaissance to Jacqueline de Romilly, 2016. Και όσον όπω νομίζω το Μάριο, θα εμφανιστεί τα, uh, στη σειρά του Penguin ένα βιβλίο uh, για την φιλοσοφία του Αριστοτέλη. Πώς ο Αριστοτέλης μπορεί να μας κάνει καλύτερους ανθρώπους. <laughs> Πολίτες. <laughs> λοιπόν, um, dear colleague, uh, Professor Paul, um, I call you to the floor or to the podium. You will, uh, your topic is Sophocles Theban rulers and Aristotle's tyrant, classical Greek lessons on deliberation and concord. Thank you very much. That was an extremely generous introduction. Oh, that was clever. Um, thank you to all the directors and to Evangelos, who's been held so helpful with practical arrangements and to um, all of you for coming to hear me. Thank you. It's a delight to be in Greece on such a sunny day by the sea. So, the great Renaissance scholar Stephen Greenblatt is about to publish a timely book on autocrats in Shakespeare, entitled simply Tyrant. He tells us that, he, um, that it's a response of his to a particular political moment, in fact, a particular election, <laughs> and that he believes that Shakespeare's portraits of tyrants can help us to understand our contemporary global politics. With a cold scalpel, he dissects the depressing features of tyranny as portrayed by Shakespeare. Narcissism, paranoia, the exemption from needing to traffic in facts or supply evidence, the moral contagion, which begins to corrupt every relationship in the state. And his book helps us appreciate the incredible psychological complexity of Shakespeare's insight into men who acquire absolute power, whether Richard III, or Macbeth, or ancient Roman leaders. But the first great detailed portraits of tyranny emerged in the classical Greek writing of Herodotus, Aristotle, and above all Sophocles. 
In this book, Greenblatt isn't focused on the classical provenance of Shakespeare's thought, although he does acknowledge the presence of Plutarch's parallel lives in Julius Caesar and Coriolanus. Now I'm going to return to Greenblatt's tyrant at the end of this lecture, but first I want to make the case that Sophocles, partly through his presence in Aristotle's thought, has made every bit as important a contribution to world thinking on tyrants as Shakespeare has. When the citizens of Athens assembled with their guests and allies in their open air theatre to watch any new play by Sophocles, they knew him as a local man, born and bred close to the heart of Athens. Athens was divided into 139 separate deems. Sophocles was born in a suburban deem only a mile to the northwest of the city centre. His father wasn't a rural member of the landed gentry, like Aeschylus' father, but an arms factory owner. Hmm. They also knew that he was um, a public-minded individual. In fact, unlike the other two tragedians, he had a political career as well as an artistic one. He held at least three significant public offices at Athens. <coughs> He seems to have been on excellent terms with Pericles, the leading political figure of the era. He served as treasurer in 443-2, very responsible position overseeing state finances for the democracy. He served as a general in the Samian War, which began in 441. And an ancient tradition recorded that he was elected to this decision by the Athenians on account of their high opinion of his Antigone. This could justify dating the play to around 442 to 1, but it also might just reveal that in antiquity people drew connections between Sophocles' political experience and the political focus of this tragedy. In any case, he was well enough respected to be invited to serve as a magistrate as an old man in 413, uh, just after the 413 crisis, after the disastrous expedition to Sicily. So his plays usually drew on his experience of leadership by exploring how rulers react to civic emergencies. Spectators will not have been puzzled that a central theme in both Antigone and Oedipus Tyrannus is the way that leaders once in power turn into friendless autocrats who throw their weight around. But nobody then had sort of suspected that these plays were destined to become two of the most important in cultural history. From its dawn, Greek literature puts assessment of leaders at its centre. Uranus is castrated in Hesiod because he oppresses his wife and his children. Agamemnon in the Iliad is a selfish, mean-spirited and sometimes incompetent king and general, envious of the very men he's expected to lead. Odysseus in the Odyssey, as his Lieutenant, Lieutenant Eurylochus points out, after his reconnaissance trip to Circe's palace, Odysseus is cavalier about putting the lives of his own men in danger. Aeschylus' Persians reveals how the young king Xerxes makes almost every mistake which Aristotle was later to catalogue as the errors associated with monarchy and tyranny in his comparative discussion of the four types of constitution in the politics. This is, of course, in turn informed by the constitutional debate held in Persia in Herodotus III, but it's more detailed and complicated. Now, Aristotle's discussion has had an incalculable influence on political thought and political practice. The very vocabulary of European political theory was born at the moment when Aristotle's politics was first translated into modern languages. It underpins the political thought of key Roman authors such as Tacitus and subsequently medieval and Renaissance theorists, especially Machiavelli. And in England, very much so, a month after the execution of Charles I in January 1649, John Milton's The Tenure of Kings and Magistrates, which justifies regicide, where the king has made himself answerable only to God, directly uses Aristotle's definition of the monarch. 
But rather earlier, Shakespeare probably read the English translation of the politics, which was published in 1598. And the politics had penetrated deep into English life already by that date through summaries and paraphrases. English intellectual Gabriel Harvey wrote in about 1580, you can't step into a scholar's study, but 10 to 1, you'll find either Baudin's De Republica or Le Roy's exposition on Aristotle's politics, or some other like French or Italian political discourses. If Shakespeare derives some of his thinking about tyrants from Aristotle, then Sophocles' tyrants present in the Renaissance theatrical cauldron as well, since there was a powerful synergy between Sophocles' tyrants, Oedipus and Creon, and Aristotle's political and moral philosophy. And since the misfortune that Creon brings on Thebes is entirely of his own doing, which is in extreme contrast to Oedipus, he was a perfect figure for Aristotle to use when thinking about how people's actions are to be judged by what they do and say. Our characters are determined and defined by what we repeatedly do. We know Aristotle thought hard about Sophocles' Creon because he points out in Poetics that Creon's character, although volatile, is consistent because he's consistently inconsistent. <laughs> I've always thought that one of Creon's first statements and one of Aristotle's mid poetics are intimately connected, and indeed that the latter may have been inspired by the former. Creon says to the theme and elders he's assembled, it is impossible to discover the psyche and judgment and wisdom of any man before he's revealed it through his actual performance in ruling and dealing with laws. Creon seems programmatically to instruct his audience how to read the rest of the play. Hey, watch me. But in the end, his own judgment is shown to be desperately wanting. And Aristotle says, in Poetics, we judge a man's character as he reveals it through his thought processes, the ania, the ania, and actions on stage. Now, we also know from repeated reference to both Oedipus and Antigone in Poetics that Aristotle knew them inside out and assumed that his students and readers did so too. A minority of scholars, such as Stephen Salkaver and Daniel DeLeo, have ignored the uh, resoundingly apolitical tenor of the Poetics, in which Aristotle actually says poetry is, poetry is discrete techne, which needs to be discussed in its own terms. They've ignored that and said that Aristotle's tragedy was used to train its audiences to resist the undermining of democracy. But how about the other way around? Far less attention has been paid to what Aristotle learned about politics and ethics from his seminal encounters with the classic tragedians of Athens. <coughs> I want to provide a supplement to a commonplace sentiment which you find often in social scientists such as Roger Bershaw, who was the professor of uh, politics at Occidental College in Los Angeles who sparked Barack Obama's interest in politics. Mm -hmm. But Bershaw is speaking for most of the discipline of politics when he writes, it is not exaggerating to say that Aristotle laid the groundwork for all subsequent theories of tyranny. But I think Aristotle continued the work, but he did not dig foundations. Aristotle's discussion emerged from a, a tradition that went back to the 5th century pre-Socratics, such as Protagoras and Zeno, and which has already given sophisticated dialogue form in Herodotus, and given its most thrilling embodiment of all in Sophocles' tyrants, Oedipus and Creon. Now, Aristotle may have used his discoveries in science as well as in ethics to help him understand theatre, I believe he did. But I'm convinced that the influence was dialectical, two-way. Was Aristotle what he himself called a philotheoros? I am. An enthusiast for dramatic spectacles equivalent to individuals with a passion for horses or justice or virtue. 
<laughs> Philotheonos is itself a theatrical word which was used by the comic poet Alexis. Aristotle cites it as an example of extreme behaviour, but not of true intemperance because it's not harmful. People who delight in songs and acting. <laughs> But references to, to dramatic texts in all of Aristotle's works are ubiquitous. <coughs> he must have seen performances in Macedonia in his childhood, and while he was tutor to Alexander, whether at um, Philippi, no, that's not ready, I want to go to that map. Whether at Philippi in the theatre Philip built there, or in the main royal centres at Aiga and Pella. He enjoys an anecdote about what Euripides did in the Macedonian court. He may have had access to theatre performances during his brief years in Assos and Lesbos in his late thirties. But he was at the epicentre of theatre culture during his two decades in Athens between the ages of 17 and 37, and then his 12 years as head of the Lyceum between uh, the ages of 49 and 61. And he returned to Athens in 336 when Philip II was assassinated at great speed. Was a main attraction? Going to the theatre? In the Poetics, he shows intense knowledge of contemporary tragedies, and as well as the 5th century canonical repertoire. He must have watched plays constantly, as well as collecting papyrus texts off them to study. Now, immersion in theatre was crucial to his ethical and political philosophy. One scholar has compared the Nicomachean ethics, the politics, and the rhetoric to a tragic trilogy whereby his students came to understand the complexity of his moral and social system. His theory of the virtues occupying a middle position on a spectrum between excess and deficiency reads like an account of stock types in theatre. The Spartan woman, the bombastic tyrant, the pimps and usurers who embody shameful profiteering, the buffoons and boars, agroikoi, the flatterer, colax, and the grouch, the viscolos. <laughs> he contrasts the aladzon and the aeron. He refers to the running slave. He shares specific vocabulary with the comic poets, like the sticky man or glisros, who's mean with money. He abbreviated one of Aristophanes' best compounds. Philocleon in the Wasps uh, talks about a person who's mean with money, and he calls him a, and this is hard, Cumino Pristo Cardamoglyphos. <laughs> now that's a mean person who splits his cooling seat and scrapes his crest leaves. It's like people who use their tea bag twice. <laughs> <laughs> and this is relevant to Aristotle's term for a mean man, the Kimino but tragedy seems to have informed his thinking about ethics and action in a deeper way, even in comedy. The relationship between intellectual activity, thinking things through, choice of action, which he observes in poetics, I think underpins much of what he has to say in the ethics about practical wisdom. Promises. So does his recognition that through some sorts of mental disturbance or vice, we may choose the worst action, I think, yes, that is articulated by characters in Euripides, although it's repudiated by the Platonic Socrates. The role of the theatre in the happy state is one he's thought about in Nicomachean Ethics 4, discussing the amount which should be spent on funding choruses. A lot! In his politics, too, the analogy of the theatrical chorus occurs when he's talking about relationships between citizens. And he argues that the Koregoi should be public officials. They're just as important as priests, ambassadors, and heralds. The um, rhetoric also. Sorry, that was too quick. The rhetoric also reveals a connection in his mind between civic speech in reality and in the fictional scenarios portrayed in drama. In book three of the rhetoric, he discusses Antigone's claim that a brother was more precious than a husband, and says he regarded the passage as, or shows he regards it as authentically Sophoclean. There's also testimony to the familiarity of Sophocles' Antigone in the fourth century Athens, where Athens, um, 
Aristotle spent the majority of his adult life. No other surviving Greek tragedy features, features so prominently in Athenian public oratory, which is evidence that by just a few decades after the play's composition, Athenian statesmen could rely on their audience understanding detailed comparison of their real contemporary situation with the situation in archaic mythical themes. The uses of Antigone in 4th century oratory provide us with evidence that ancient audiences did interpret tragedy in ways that involved sophisticated political allegory, as well as aesthetic <coughs> and moral judgments. Aristotle recommends in the rhetoric that speakers would do well to quote Antigone when appealing to universal law. And rhetoric to, uh, reference to Antigone provides ammunition for the author of one of the two most famous 4th century Athenian political speeches. In 343, Demosthenes delivered a great speech known as On the False Embassy, in which he accused his rival Aeschines of misleading the Athenians, of treacherously faming Philip of Macedon, and of venal corruption on embassies to the Macedonians. And one of Demosthenes' strategies in undermining Aeschines' credibility relies on the audience's knowledge of Sophocles' Antigone. Now, Aeschines had been a professional actor and quoted plays liberally in his own political speeches. Why, asked Demosthenes, has he never recited the speech by Creon concerning the importance of putting his duty to the city before any loyalty to friends? Now, Demosthenes here means Creon's first inauguration speech on his first entrance in the play, especially the central light in which Creon, after criticising the kind of man who considers a friend more important than his fatherland, says, I would never make a man who's an enemy of my country a friend. Now, Demosthenes here supplies information about a very particular 4th century performance of Antigone. He tells us that Aeschines had often played the role of Creon when the other roles had been taken by the great actors Theodorus and Aristodemus, so the greatest actors mid fourth century. Mm. Aeschines thus knew Creon's lines off by heart. But Aeschines, says Demosthenes, had nevertheless put the enemy Philip above Athens. This is Demosthenes. He was not concerned to ensure that the ship of state should sail on even keel. He scuttled her, he sank her, and to the extent that he was able, put her at the mercy of her enemies. Are not you then a fraud? Yes, you are, and a loathsome one as well. You're a speechwriter, aren't you? Yes, you are, and I'm principal one to boot. You ignored the speech that you so often delivered on stage and you by heart. Demosthenes assumes he can rely on his audience not only to remember Creon's speech, but even details in it, which Demosthenes doesn't quote explicitly. His use of the naval metaphor is designed to work ironically against the extended metaphor of steering the ship of state, which runs through the Sophocles speech. And the political message behind this whole passage of Demosthenes is much more complicated than, I first, than it first seems. At first, it seems that he's simply endorsing Creon's sentiments. But what the greater context signifies is absolutely the opposite. What sticks in Demosthenes' audience's memory is that Aeschines had played Creon, the greatest failure as a civic leader in all of Greek literature. It's like blaming the President of the United States, he used to act cowboys because he acted a cowboy. Mm. The stereotype of the incompetent ruler who leads his people into justice, death and destruction has, by the 340s, found in Demosthenes and Aristotle's Athens its recognisable instance in the creole of Sophocles' Antigone. And Aristotle's discussion of the Constitution rests on intensive research at the Lyceum, he and his students collected data on the history of dozens of Greek polis and an unusual range of lived experience. And that's where this map really belongs. He was born and brought up in Stagora, 
than a free and autonomous city-state, which was later crushed by Macedon. He spent two decades in democratic Athens, and then 12 years from the age of 50 to a year before his death, which was in Kalkila. All his life was spent in the shadow of the rising autocracy of Macedon. His father was employed as a doctor by Amintas. He was employed by Philip II himself uh, for seven years as tutor to Alexander. But he also spent at least a year in Lesbos, which was almost certainly ruled by oligarchy. And in 345 to 44, he was with his friend Hermias, the tyrant in Assos and Atanus in what is now Turkey. And I have been there, it is amazing. Hermias had been his friend as a fellow student at the academy. He invited Aristotle to his court when Plato died. His kingdom was based on these two beautiful cities. Uh, it's a dazzling clifftop citadel with curving rock-cut pathways, a uh, wonderful Doric temple of Athena on the top. It must have felt like a mini Athens. And a view of the turquoise sea. Hermias's kingdom bordered on the Persian Empire, but in 348, the Persian monarch Artaxerxes seems to have decided to leave him alone. Assos was constitutionally a tyranny, but the term didn't always bear the pejorative associations it has in English and Greek now. A tyrant ruled because he'd inherited the throne, um, not because he'd inherited the throne, but because he'd come into sole power with the support of the masses, often in reaction to an unpopular monarch or oligarchy. A tyrant became sole ruler as a result of the will of a majority, as in a democracy, usually by a coup rather than an election. Because tyrannies initially needed popular support, until the tyrant became repressive, which of course usually happened, <laughs> Aristotle notes that tyrannies share certain features with democracies, including greater freedom for women, children and slaves. Now, extreme social mobility was not unknown in antiquity. Hermias was originally a slave. He belonged to Eubulus, a wealthy banker, who swept to power as tyrant of Atanus on a tide of popular consent. And like Eubulus, Hermias was a remarkable man. He escaped slavery because his intelligence was noticed. And once freed, he went to study in Athens. He then inherited the rule of Atanus and Assos when Eubulus died. And then he encouraged Aristotle and mutual philosophical friends to found a school under his patronage. Let me ask love philosophy. He was described by Theophrastus as an ideal student. He thought that surrounding himself with outstanding thinkers might help him become a good ruler. Two other students from the academy set up a philosophical centre not far to the north at Skepsis in Ida. And an inscription survives from nearby ancient Smyrna, which shows Hermias's government proposing an alliance with another local city called Erythrae. And it refers to the government of Hermes and his companions, rather than just Hermias. Some people think he created an official body of aides, including Aristotle, to act as a cabinet of advisors in an effort to advance the happiness of his independent little kingdom. Perhaps Aristotle assisted in the drafting of laws. He once says about political theory, this would become especially clear if we can see a constitution put together in practice. And other evidence suggests that Aristotle and the former academicians persuaded Hermias to run a more democratic regime. We can imagine Aristotle and Hermias taking walks around wonderful little city, discussing the problems of government, and I like to think those ended up in the politics. Now, Aristotle's discussion identifies two categories of tyranny. The traditional tyrant, like Periander of Corinth, relies on exterminating spirited members of the community, distrusting everyone, prohibiting any institutions, fostering a sense of collective identity, 
and trust, like dining clubs and schools, scrutinising everything everyone does and says, and especially sowing dissent between friends, citizens and social classes. That is the very opposite of the nurturing of harmonia, like-mindedness or single purpose. Praised by 5th century thinkers, including Gorgias, Democrates, Democritus and Euripides. But another passage doesn't receive as much attention. Aristotle says, it's a characteristic of a tyrant to dislike everyone who has dignity or independence. He wants to be alone in his glory. Anyone who claims to like dignity or asserts independence encroaches on his prerogative and is hated by him. The second kind of tyrant, according to Aristotle, succeeds in holding on to supreme power by disguising himself as a nice guy and avoiding the appearance of all the characteristics Aristotle has identified in the traditional tyrant. He has to look as though he cares about public money, he should publish his accounts, and his demeanour is crucial. Aristotle says he should appear not harsh but dignified. When men meet him, they should look upon him with reverence and not with fear. He must mm -hmm. require respect, appear to be a good soldier, <laughs> and ensure that neither he nor his associates should ever be guilty of the least offence against any of the young of either sex who are his subject. And this respect for the younger generation is really, really interesting, that somehow they're more vulnerable, and that you, and, and Antigone is all about these young people. He should also appear to be sort of religious, because if men think Aruna reveres the gods, they're less afraid of suffering injustice at his hands. And he must honour people of merit, so they don't stop to think they'll be given more honour if they live in a free constitution, so you buy off the able. <laughs> Any punishments must, must be the business of courts and officers and not of the tyrant. If anyone needs to have their power reduced, then a good tyrant will do it gradually. Above all, he must abstain from all outrage, especially towards the young. He needs to be careful of his behaviour towards men who love honour and ambition. If he does have to control them, he should be thought to employ fatherly correction and not trample on them. The paradox with this kind of deliberately benign-looking, youth-friendly, cuddly, daddy-focused <coughs> tyranny is, of course, that actually it stops being a tyranny. The tyrant will last if he's an object of hatred, if he's not afraid of his people, and they're not afraid of him, but then he really stops being a tyrant. The canonical tragedies about tyranny in the classical repertoire are set in Bronze Age themes. The sumptuous evidence edifice in the ancient citadel, excavated in the early 20th century, this is what I saw when I was about 10, and I decided to become a classicist, yeah. <laughs> housed an ancient nobility which to Athenian democrats had stood for everything they hated. An aristocratic constitution, connivance with the Persians, support of Spartan military activities in central Greece. Theban citadel was just near enough to Athens, about 18 hours walk, to be a real psychological presence even across Kephiron. Mm. No wonder the ancient poets, including all the playwrights of the maritime, culturally open and noisy Athenian democracy, used the mysterious space contained within the walls of Thebes as a setting for dark political tragedies. The community there is always portrayed as too introverted, too suspicious of outside influence, to be open to hybridity, revitalization, immigrants, change and renewal. Mm -hmm. It's ruling aristocracy prone to secrets, incest, dogmatism, grudges, and eternal power struggles that develop in any closed and unaccountable ruling class. There is always something with the way the social order works in Thebes. And if we read Sophocles' Antigone in the light of Aristotle's tyrant, we can see how Creon's Thebes mirrors the unhappy state which Aristotle envisaged suffering under his definitive traditional tyrant. The play opens with a scene showing how even the closest loving relationship 
with people who should be philoi, that is, full sisters, is sabotaged by the ruling behaviour of the ruling tyrant. By being prevented from doing the ritual work of cleansing and singing in laments over the corpse, Antigone is forced into becoming one of those spirited, honour-loving, troublesome subjects, which the tyrant must be particularly careful, careful, careful of handling. She is forced into intervening in the public sphere when her menfolk, now her maternal uncle Creon, neglect to allow her her gender-specific duties. There is a corrosive lack of clarity also about what kind of constitutional power Creon wields. It's all very confusing. Antigone calls him a general, Strategos. He seems to be called Turmos by Ismini, but she also says in a strange phrase that she and Antigone should not, in spite of the law, nomos, go against the vote, vote, psiphon, of tyrants. Tyrants are getting psiphon. A few moments later, she implies that Creon is somehow identifiable for the, the will of the politi. The chorus, who've been handpicked by Creon as the men most loyal to Laius's monarchy, call him Basileus. But they call him the Basileus Neochmos. He's only just started ruling. And he's the son of a man who never, ever held royal power, Menoikius. And the word Neochmos is startling. Usually it applies not to people, but to things, and with negative connotations. The term used for the group which the chorus constitute is also very unusual. It is not a vuli, it's not an ecclesia, it's a sincliton gerodon lesien, convened by heralds sent round to each one. Now, lesien usually implies a very private sort of conversation. And Creon's inaugural speech is peculiar. He tells us why he selected his particular groups of senior Thebans and separated from, from the rest, ek pardon vicha, <coughs> thus using Caesar's policy of divide and rule, sowing seeds of dissent between the citizens. This is the opposite of nurturing harmonia and has been his first act. The reason he separated them is that they always revered Laius' throne of power. <coughs> Antigone later addresses these chosen ones as the Koiranidae of Thebes, an unusual word which must mean something like members of the ruling houses, but she meanwhile says she's the only one left of the royal household. Left seter thebes ikiramile, te fazilitar munen lipi. She says, I am the last one of the royal family, but you are Koiranidae. But now both brothers are dead, Creon holds the whole power and throne according to what he calls kinship closest to them. He doesn't say whether he thinks he's a Basileus or a Tyrannos. The chorus increasingly, interestingly, draw attention to his ancestry as not being a descendant of Cadmus or Laius, but the son of Minoicus. And others use different vocabulary. The first messenger calls him the him and Eurydice, his wife, Eridiki, the Vespotis and the Vespina. And that implies that he's a household slave, and is thinking in terms of the domestic relationship, not a constitutional one. Yet in his summation of the disaster which has overtaken Creon with the death of Hymen, he expresses a positive view of the public role of Creon before today. Creon, as I saw it, was blessed before, having saved the land of Cadmus and having won sole and total dominion in the land, but the least monarchia, he guided it on a straight course. One wonders whether this happy picture is the official line in Creon's household. Mm. Now, when Creon tells the chorus he's already delivered the proclamation about the policy, it's a fait accompli. There is no consultation. And their response is unenthusiastic. Well, that's what you decided, and you're entitled to use any law in regards to living and dead. And in the ensuing odd dialogue, uh, it comes quite clear that he's been very busy. He's put guards out already around the corpse of Polynices. And he says that the chorus must be very careful not to spare his commands. 
or let anyone else. And they say, there's no one so foolish as to crave death. Now, they ostensibly mean they don't think anyone will deliberately incur the death penalty by burying polynices, but by putting this statement into a gnomic third person, they generalise the situation in the so it includes everyone. Everyone is afraid of death. And Creon makes no attempt to clear up the ambiguity. I assure you, he says, that is the wage for disobedience. Creon does do almost all the things which Aristotle says distinguish is the worst kind of tyrant. He delivers uh, edicts which determine the punishment of things he's decided are crimes. He punishes them even by death. He does not delegate such matters to magistrates or courts. He accuses the guard of taking bribes on no evidence. It's conspicuous that the guard can't even believe it when he escapes alive. Thebans expect Creon to decree a summary execution. And he later completely oversteps the mark when he decrees death to his meaning on no evidence. He outrages domestic piety by interfering with the performance of duties between close kin. As Antigone says, he has no right to keep me from my own. Hmm. His rule promotes secrecy and lies and denunciations. His meaning begs Antigone to keep her secret. Everything's going to be secret. His rule promotes discord internally to classes and between classes. The guards are so frightened of him that they fight amongst themselves when they see the corpses being buried. They cannot present even the union of grave guards can't have a single voice. Evil words stood thick and loud amongst us, guard accusing guard, it would have come to blows. Nor was there anyone there to prevent it. Every man was the culprit, no one was plainly guilty, while all disclaimed knowledge of the acts. We were ready to take red hot iron in our hands, to walk through fire, to swear oaths. At last, when our investigating has got us nowhere, someone spoke up, misbend all bend our faces in fear towards the earth. We did not know how we could argue or prosper. His argument was the deed must be reported to you and not hidden. And the lot doomed miserable me to win the prize. So here I stand, as unwelcome to you, as I am unwilling, I well know. In fact, everyone is terrified of speaking to Creon and voicing their views. Hyman says this explicitly, your face is terrifying. He hears the Townsfield people saying things under cover of darkness, that they wouldn't, that he wouldn't like, including praising Antigone's actions for being worthy of great honour and fame. And Creon admits to do most of the things which Aristotle says distinguishes the better kind of tyrant. The absence of any reference to him in the paradox victory song implies that he's done nothing to defend his city as a soldier. His reference to the gods at the beginning of his first speech is utterly peremptory. Ten words tucked away in a two-line men clause before a death clause. And when the chorus pondered whether there might not be divine involvement in the strange things happening around Polynices' corpse, he simply shouts at them to shut up. Most illuminating of all is that sudden revelation, very near the end, that his other son, Megarius, has very recently died in connection with yesterday's battle. The man we've been watching so tyrannically throw his weight about in the public sphere has been personally bereaved from the beginning of the play. Remember that Demosthenes was criticised for appearing in public seven days after his daughter died. So in Antigone we have a powerful example of a Theban of considerable ability, in Antigone the woman, She's considerable ability, and who is ambitious to gain honour for herself. She's the type of figure Aristotle says the tyrant needs to be particularly careful about handling. She asks, how could I have won a noble glory, nobler glory than my giving burial to my own brother? And she says, everyone here would say that she deserved the glory if fear did not grip their tongues. Rather than treating her with conspicuous respect, as Aristotle advises a successful tyrant must, he humiliates her as well as sentencing, sentencing her to death for that action which has brought her admiration. But finally, I think it's the emphasis on deliberation in the play 
which would have attracted Aristotle's attention, since gubu lear, every lear, giving and taking advice well, is one of the hallmarks of the great souled man in the Nicomachean ethics. And in fact, Aristotle wrote a whole treatise, now lost, on Eubulia. The Athenians had deliberation built into their constitution. They heard detailed debates in the assembly about the expedience of their policies before they voted. The Athenian officials charged with deliberating the policies at length before they went to the assembly were members of the council, Bouli. And the deliberators or councillors of the Bouli, at the time of the drama competitions, were symbolically privileged as the thought leaders of the city and sat together in seats at the front of the theatre. And the importance of the boule bouli in the Athenian democracy is underlined by the haste with which the oligarchs who took power in 411 ousted the democratically elected councillors and took over their official seat, the bouletirio, as their centre of power. Mm. The council was an amazing thing. It met almost every day. It considers matters relating not only to the state's finances and the scrutiny of magistrates, but cults, festivals, navy, building program care for the sick, the disabled, and the orphans. Mm. To serve as a councillor, which you had to do for a whole year, and probably the vast majority of actual Athenian citizen men did this for, at one point in their lives, required accumulating information, assessing past actions, deliberating about future, future ones, all day, every day, for a year. And this quality of attention required by service on the council seems breathtaking compared with what's required of politicians, <laughs> let alone ordinary citizens today. And Creon didn't possess a show of it. When Sophocles served as treasurer, general, and magistrate, he would have had much business to conduct with the council. His audience would have been aware of his experience and performance in those capacities. So, in Antigone, Creon's incompetent deliberation causes unnecessary chaos, several deaths, in addition to those of Polynices and Antigone's, and desperate suffering. There is no consolation for the tragedy in the form of a lovely new cult, as in Oedipus and Colonus. It's just a mess. And it's been caused not by Apollo's mysterious, serious, and unavoidable agenda, not by the Delphic Oracle, but by the wholly avoidable decisions made by a single fool who could have learned a thing or two by serving on the Athenians' Democratic Council. Mm. Creon himself <coughs> likes to use deliberation terms, especially the noun Vulevmata. Is that how you say it now? Vulevmata. Mm -hmm. But no deliberation has preceded his decree. His first speech says that he's issued the decree, and the first of that of which is anyone who, while guiding the whole city, fails to set is how to the best councils, Bele who does that is the worst of men. In the event he's enraged when he does soon hear wise counsel from the chorus, after the guard has described the dust that's co covered Polynices' body, their thoughts, they say, have suggested to them, Vuli, that the matter has to do with the gods, and he shuts them up. When he said Antigone defend her actions, his fury produces the first of his precipitate decisions. He does not consult his elders, and he suddenly regards, decides that regardless of the family ties, she and her sister must have a dreadful death. Creon fails to benefit from several potentially very helpful consultants. They keep coming in to offer advice, because as Hymen says, he never takes up opportunities to listen to what anybody says. Tiresias has another statement to make about advice taking. He says, good advice has a long shelf life. Even a man who's made a mistake could sometimes rectify it if he acts, however late, to correct it. I.e., he doesn't have to stay agulos and anobos. You can change your mind late in the dead. And actually, the example Aristotle uses of that in the Nicomachean ethics is Philip T Neoptolemus in Philoctetes. It's not for Neoptolemus, but he says, look at Philoctetes, Neoptolemus does do the right thing if late, he still does it. Now, the important 
concept, this concept of the play emerges in Tiresias's retort to Creon's savage attack. Why don't you realise, Creon, that the most helpful of assets is good advice and deliberation? Every Leah. And exactly the same term is used by the chorus, now brave enough to speak out. Evelias V, <coughs> son of Minoicus, you must take this good advice. And they tell him to release Antigone immediately. He obeys, but far too late. And he uses the same words in the final scene. He says, it is my own poor Ulev Mata that made the death. It is my own this Uliyas that have caused all of this. So Sophocles makes jolly sure that we know that the problem here was lack of deliberation, all right? Now, his incompetence as a deliberator receives uniquely explicit comment in Greek tragedy, and I think this is one of the reasons why it was so admired from a political perspective in antiquity. Antigone presents us with an incompetent deliberator who holds sole power, whether it's Strategos, Turanos, Basilius, Monarchus, or Arpho, offending the gods and creating avoidable tragedy. Now, I said at the outset I would return to Shakespeare at the end of this lecture. It's not known, sorry, it is now known, where it used to be emphatically denied by Shakespeare scholars, that Shakespeare had access to Greek tragedies through the wide circulation of Renaissance Latin. The complete seven plays of Sophocles had become available in Latin in 1550 and was widely circulated amongst European humanists who knew no Greek. But this particular Greek tragedy had the unusual privilege of being translated on its own in 1581 by English scholar-poet Thomas Watson. Beautiful translation to beautiful Latin. And amongst the traces of Greek tragedy in Shakespeare, which are most widely accepted, is the glimpses of Antigone in King Lear. Shakespearean tragedy in which Greenblatt says the high cost of a strategy of resistance to tyranny is most starkly portrayed. And when he staggers onto the stage in despair and remorse carrying the corpse of his youngest child Cordelia, it's not difficult to imagine Shakespeare being impressed by Creon's closing entrance in Antigone carrying the corpse of his son. Mm. There are many other details once you accept this possibility, like Cordelia's hanging in prison far away, which begins to remind us of Sophocles' play, especially the speech of the loyal Kent. There's a, he's a sort of Hymon figure, he's a combination of Hymon and Tiresias. He's the one courtier who tries to resist Lear's crazy plans for carving up the kingdom and banishing Cordelia. And he sounds like the chorus Tiresias and Hymon all rolled into one. In thy best consideration, check this hideous rashness. And he has a great speech trying to persuade Leila out of what he's doing. Like Sophocles, Thebes, and Antigone, there is a complete lack of state apparatus in Leila's early, early, early England. His early English world has no institutions or offices, no parliament, no privy council, no commissioners, no high priests to moderate or dilute royal power. And Lear is also said to be inconsistent. He has inconstant starts, one of his daughters says. And Greenblatt could surely be summarising Antigone when he writes in his book, in general terms, of Shakespeare's portraits of tyranny in action. This is Greenblatt. Shakespeare did not think tyrants ever lasted for long. However cunning they were on their rise, once in power, they were surprisingly <coughs> incompetent. Possessing no vision for the country they ruled, they were incapable of fashioning enduring support. Though they were cruel and violent, they could never crush all of the opposition. Their isolation, suspicious, and anger often conjoined to an arrogant overconfidence hastened their downfall. And Antigone, whether in Sophocles' version, or adaptations by Ennui or Brecht, or other versions deriving from them, is quantifiably the most influential ancient drama in performance of all time. It is also in terms of political instrumentality. 
from Robin Island and apartheid South Africa to the dockyards of Gdansk, from the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina to the independence movement in Manipur, Antigone has fought against tyranny. And a time when autocracy, the unaccountability of rulers, whether democratically elected or not, attacks on freedom of speech everywhere, promotion of social division, the very opposite of what one year, and a total absence of careful deliberation seems to characterise our new global political culture. Surely it's important to remember the human race has survived such political situations in the past. Mm -hmm. Moreover, in the works of Aristotle and Shakespeare, and earlier than either of them, Sophocles, we have been given wonderfully powerful tools with which to analyse and resist them. Thank you. Questions? Do you entertain questions? Error pieces? Not for me. <laughs> um, I'm American um, and have been uh, you know, an expat for a number of years. Um, since Trump was elected, I feel a bit like a political refugee. Sure. You know, I, I can't live in that country, in the country where he's in power. Um, and there's a lot of like-minded people will actually want to do something about our <laughs> lack of democracy in the United States, and are talking about um, you know getting rid of the electoral college and that kind of stuff. And, and there's a lot of movement in that direction, um, but I don't know that there's a lot of knowledge about true democracy and how it works. Mm -hmm. And it would be wonderful to put that knowledge in the discussion. It's like, yes, we know this system doesn't work. It hasn't worked for, you know, there, there's a debate about how long it hasn't worked, but there isn't really a debate about it doesn't work now. You know, so uh, what happened to, you know, this conspiracy theories, all that kind of stuff, to, to me is irrelevant. It's, it's like, it's broken, so it needs to be fixed. Um, but I was fascinated with the thought of the, um, the council. <coughs> and it's much more how, exciting you know, how, how they don't disappear and government doesn't shut down. And yes, and where they come from and who they represent and all that stuff. And how they consider. Um, and how uh, the di uh, dialogue and dissent is an essential part of democracy. Duh, you know? But I don't think people know that. No, no, no. And I would love to know if there's some sources and things like, um, ways that I can, you know, in my various groups and my, my way to fight uh, is through dialectic, you know. Is there a way I can, are there some sources I can go to? Things I can, yeah, I can pick up and learn and, and then, you know, put into the dialogue. I, I, I hear you completely. Um, I would advise you to go to Paul Cartledge's book called Democracy Alive. He's a classicist. Okay. Who, well, although well. what most people would call an arm left winger, <laughs> uh, does think that the Athenian democracy <laughs> is an exceptional model, yeah. despite the slavery, despite everything else. But this whole idea of the participating citizen who rules himself. That's, that, 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 that's, that's, the, that's the crucial thing. That you are your own, our home, because you, you, you participate in government. And I think you'll find all the really important sources are lined up very well um, in that one. I certainly found, when I first, this book by a man called Peter Rhodes, but it's quite technical, called Just the Athenian Council. I and mean, this is where I got the footnote for all the detail on the council goes mm -hmm. uh, to, to his book, a former colleague of mine. But it's the council which is so astonishing. I mean, the idea that we all vote every few years on something is 
familiar enough, though party politics is unknown to classical Latin. But the idea that we all, every cit free citizen, has actually got to take up some proper burdens of deliberation and be educated enough to do that. Mm -hmm. This is why they all had to become literate. I mean, it was all part of the same thing, literacy. They couldn't, a lot of them, I think, write very well, but they had to be able to read laws and accounts and mm -hmm. things stuck, on, stuck up on a pin which is the big tablets they used mm -hmm. uh, when they were talk, making, and they all had to, the jury system, I mean, the nearest analogy is jury service. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they only absolutely ever what they've got to be supposed to do that. But um, that's the only way to sort of explain it to the average citizen of Ohio, I should think. Or indeed to Birmingham, Birmingham <laughs> England. But it is, it is we're, we're just so... And I've got a little hope for the future. My kids are 17 and 19, and until three years ago, I had absolutely no interest in politics whatsoever. None. Mm -hmm. They're just boring, switch off the TV. We could not get them interested. What combination of Brexit Trump and actually, one of them gets very upset about everyone. I mean, yeah, also, you know, that you actually, the idea that you elect people who then take away your civil liberties. Um, they both of them, they're girls, nothing to do with me. I mean, honestly, they have been completely radicalised. They were going out on <laughs> marches with women. They both joined the Labour Party. I, 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 I'm no kidding, because of some sense that we've all, I well, baby boomers have completely screwed everything for them. Yeah. And, and ecologically. And ecologically. So I mean I think I, I think that I think change is beginning in the generation that matters. Mm -hmm. Not many people in this room are in that age group. <laughs> they were insane to say. I was very, very encouraged that they both got out and just joined the Labour Party and, and they're informed. They're now informed, yeah, they really are. They, they follow Twitter accounts for MPs they like. So maybe now's the time to get all the American youth politicised. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the same in Greece. Aren't the young people so fed up that they look probably quite political and all so that things are going well? Uh, 
gave us a, uh, all took as a, as a given that the, the democracy is more or less ideal uh, <laughs> kind of government. And I do believe that this is not Aristotle's view, really. Yeah. So I wonder here why I was thinking that, that what Aristotle is doing is that he is comparing patch of government. And democracy is under scrutiny as well as other types of government. And uh, considering your question now, uh, I think that what we don't do nowadays is put democracy under real scrutiny. So we take for granted that representationalism is something good. But we should, forget, we should not forget that Trump, <laughs> Brexit, and even Hitler were all produced by democratic uh, processes. So I wonder whether here we now, in operation, we should be, we should start scrutinizing these, or examining this kind of government against other kind of governments to see what its real advantage is, or, as a result, end up with a different result. <laughs> okay, now, well first I, I uh, disagree with you. I think on balance he finds less fault with democracy than with the other three systems, yes. definitely. Of course he's open and clear about all the terrible things that can happen to it, that can slide into tyranny and so on. But he finds far less fault with it. He chose to go and live there, so <laughs> he, um, despite not even having full citizen rights. Um, so I would say that for a start. But on the second thing, I, don't, I do not believe we live under anything like a, a place where the demos has the kratos. Um, electoral democracy, in, to me, is very corrupt and, and, and strange form as uh, it's emerged um, in terms of giving everybody the vote, and not until the 20th century, anyway. The right to put a piece of paper in a box every four years to vote for one gang or another gang mm -hmm. is not giving the, the demos the kratos remotely. It, it's simply not. And because of globalization and vested economic interests, blah, 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 I think we live under a sort of plutocratic oligarchy mm -hmm. with a thin veneer. Uh, we call, right, I actually don't believe we live under what I call democracy. So I absolutely agree with you. Right? I, I mean, I agree with you that what we've got now has to go and we've got to scrutinise it, but that's not because we don't want to achieve what Aristotle defined as a democracy, because I think we do. That's not what we define as democracy. Actually, Paul Cartledge's book, I just recommended, takes the same view that we live under a very specific kind of disguised oligarchy um, mm -hmm. of plutocratic roots. Globalised ones now which make it almost impossible for small countries actually <coughs> effectively to change their power structures. I mean, Greece is, knows this very, very well. Getting out, of, how do you get out of globalised monopoly capital? It's what Corbyn wants to do. It is. It's exactly what Corbyn wants to do. He wants to give it a try, and I'm, I'm, I'm I will vote for him. Okay. <laughs> we may all end up with no railways. <laughs> <laughs> but we might be socialist and happy. What's the name again? So, Corbyn, yeah. And he, has, I mean, he, he wants to get out of global capitalism. He thinks he can do it. Wow. <laughs> okay. uh, I think I am not, uh, I don't share your view of uh, the greatness of Athenian democracy. I think there is greatness in, in, in uh, uh, certain aspects of this, like yeah. theater and philosophy, but I think that uh, there was lots of meanness, and, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, and, and actually, what, what what we appreciate is it, that their own criticism, like in Aristophanes, for instance, and even well, everybody, uh, uh, so that there was uh, this liberty uh, of uh, of criticism and this uh, willingness for self-examination, uh, but otherwise, I think that. Uh, not, uh, I, I don't see any other uh, moral greatness in it. There, there was mm. lots of mess there. And uh, uh, just as a, as a question, don't you see lots of uh, 
dus Polia in uh, 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 Twitter en uh, in, in social media. I okay. think it's not, it's, it, 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 it's not even uh, pretending to be about deliberation, it's about somebody and uh, 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 shouting someone out. Okay. Total totally bullying, I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. both Thucydides and Aristotle and every single text on ancient Euboulia says the great enemies of good decision making are tachus, tachis, speed and orgy. Mm -hmm. Orgy? Yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. And I exactly. think that the, we, you know, email and Twitter and Instagram says it all, right? The, the, the fact that we do not anymore deliberate. I think it, I, I could not agree with you more about that. Um, I mean, Trump's tweeting, of course, really oh, yeah. <laughs> is, is the ultimate example. But we, we all do it. I mean, my husband has actually banned me from answering emails after a glass of wine. I mean, you know, he, he literally goes and switches off all the machines. Because in the old days, you know, you got very angry with someone at work, you went home, you wrote a letter, a letter, remember those, yeah. put it in an envelope by the front door to post in the morning, went to sleep, and of course there is actually an ancient Greek proverb, um, en, en nichti, en nicht, uh, it is a nichti, with US style or something. Yeah, that's like, and not so conciliators. Not motto of Birkbeck College in, in Latin. Um, we all know it's true that the first wave of emotion is not the one to act on. We all know it, right? And yet we've now legitimised it yeah, universally um, as the, as, as the way, way to respond. I think there should be some sort of hold on emails if they have to go in a box for two hours or. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? emotional reaction is very often not the sensible decision. I personally believe that that's what all these Delphic Oracle things were for in antiquity. It was really hard to get an appointment with <laughs> the <bit there. laughs> You only had so many slots a year, and you've got to put them in advance, you've got to get them. So before you go to war, or before you send off all your sons to found a new colony in Libya, <laughs> right, you send you, get, you book somewhere at the place at the Delphic Oracle, wait all the months it takes there, travel there, get it, and get back. By which time, the idea may well not. <laughs> Actually building in delay. Uh, building in delay can be an incredibly sensible uh, response for, for absolutely all of us. I, I have written a whole lot, I mean, one of my beliefs is that that's why Greek tragedy evolved into the single, uh, the run of a single day, between the, the sun, sun, sunrise and sunset, is because we're shown people under enormous pressure. That's what Sophocles, who loves it in particular, often goes out of his way to have people come and say, oh look, it's sunrise. Or Medea says, you know, Creon says, Medea, you've got until the next sunrise to get up in. And we, we're told this, so that everybody's acting under this, just like, just like um, the Mytilenean debate in Thucydides where it's all set up, that the ship's already gone off to kill everyone, right? And we're going to have another assembly. Can the ship get out of there? It's like a movie. It's all set up to be under the maximum possible uh, pressure. So it's, um, I think they were very conscious of it. We are, and we have done the most stupid thing possible, which has made it possible to send messages <laughs> to anyone in the world. And yes, I think we're seeing, with a lot of the things that have happened lately, Lynching by lynching by internet. I've actually had, and I'm not even famous like Mary Beard, who suffered terribly um, from. But I, I, I've had a very great deal of very unpleasant twittering. But just any woman <laughs> who stands up with an opinion, <laughs> just any woman who stands up with an opinion, gets told to lose weight or. general principle, we all, we all know what I'm, I'm talking about, you know, it's, 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 it's been quite horrific, actually. Mm -hmm. 